Hey everybody and welcome to another episode of the First World War. I am Mike B and today we are going to be talking about poop. Yes, you heard that correctly. This was actually a uh, viewer's idea. The last video I did that was uh, about the U.S. Um, food service in the First World War. Um, he commented on that. The username is Night Shaft, so thank you for that idea. And commented with, uh, you know, it'd be kind of funny to talk about where all that food goes, you know. So, yeah, I'm going to be talking about kind of the sanitation regarding sewage, like um, pee and poop specifically, and how they dealt with that and mitigated that. Because obviously in those tight, cramped conditions in a trench, or wherever you are for that matter, uh, bunker, dugout, whatever, you need to keep that stuff away from your guys or you will have infections, you will have disease, uh, you will have really bad things happening because of that, all that bacteria, all the uh, parasites that live in there, the animals, uh, just not a good thing, right? We've known that for quite a long time that uh, poop and pee do not mix well. There's a reason your body gets rid of it. So, um, and you also want to have it as far away from you as possible because of the smell and just, it, it's not healthy. It, your body thinks it smells bad for a reason, except for some of you freaks out there that are wired a little bit different and you uh, don't mind spending time in a sewer tank or a septic tank videos of that online. But anyway, um, so yeah, this video obviously is going to contain a lot of uh, poop related material. So if that stuff kind of bothers you or you're like, I'm too mature for that, you can just stop watching. But if you want to know about historic facts and uh, know a little bit more about something that has to do with the bodily function that literally everybody does, stay tuned. Um, so this is actually, all jokes aside, this is a really good question. I love answering questions like this because it's something that was an everyday occurrence, okay? But nobody really wants to think about it or just doesn't think about it. But it's a very important thing as well. There's a lot of important things. This is one near the top of that list for um, hygiene and stuff. So what they would do is a few different things. Um, they're really, you know, there's not going to be running water. There's going to be standing water, but there's not going to be running water most of the time in the trenches. So how do you mitigate this? Well, a lot of the times they would dig these things called slit trenches, right? Where they're only about that wide and, you know, however deep you want to do it. And sometimes they have little logs that you can sit on or a board or something. Uh, here's a photo of some Germans. I don't know what year this picture's from. This is from the World War I colorized uh, photos group or page on Facebook that I talk about in other videos. Make sure you go ahead and give them a follow. There's some really good history on there. Um, and then, yeah, this guy that colorizes stuff, uh, Piece of Jake, he does really good work. So I think he does commission work too. So if you want to have a family photo colorized, you can pay him a few shekels and he'll do that. I think all these guys do that. Um, they, they're really talented. Anyway, all that stuff aside, there's a picture. And in the comment section, nonetheless, this was actually a really funny one. Uh, there was a German guy that said, oh yeah, we still call this the Donaubalken or the thunder log in the German military in the Bundeswehr. So really, when you look at this picture, nothing at all changes from soldiers in any country at any time period. We do the same crap today, literally. You know, and the funniest thing is, is not only did somebody take a picture of this, but there is somebody, Jake, that was willing to spend the insane amount of time colorizing a bunch of bare asses hanging over a log pooping into a trench. So I thought that was kind of good. Anyway, so... That is going to be a really common thing, right? Back on track. And sometimes, like, you'd have your front trench, your reserve trench, your communication trench, and all that stuff. And then you'd have a slit trench away from there, but still accessible so you could get up and walk and go to the bathroom over there peeing and pooping. Because even if you just start peeing in the corner, uh, that stuff's going to leak and seep into the ground. It turns to ammonia. Not a good thing. So, yeah, they try to keep it out of the trenches as much as possible. And... Slit trenches, I think some places that were more well-established, like specifically some of the German positions, I read somewhere that they would have, you know, in the dugouts, they would dig outhouses where it was basically a dugout, and then they'd dig, you know, a 20-foot hole or something like that, and then crap and pee in there until it was full, cover it up, and then move on. That's what they do with the slit trenches, too. When they were full, they'd cover them up and dig a different one in a different location and keep it as far away from the guys as possible. Now, the distance between the front the front trench or whatever trench you were in and the, the slit trenches or your latrine, basically, is going to vary based on where you were at and the situation and all that stuff. But generally, it was close enough for people to just get up and walk, kind of like a latrine is nowadays. So that was that. Now, the more gross version of what would happen in the front line trench, specifically in the uh, main trench, is 
very nasty, but it's also, it, it just kind of speaks wonders as to how everything was weaponized during the First World War. So I know when the Americans got there, the French had been doing this for a while because they were the ones that said, hey, this is how we do this. It kills two birds with one stone. So you've got garbage from rations that the Americans didn't have, but the French gave them, you know, with tin cans and all this stuff. You've got garbage. What do you do with that? Do you burn it and, you know, give your exact position away? Nah. So what they would do a lot of times is they would eat food or, you know, they'd pee into a can or something like that. And then they'd just toss it over the front, out right in front of their trench. They'd also take a crap on a shovel or some other thing, you know, crap into a can or something, and then throw that out in front of the trench too. Now that served a couple different purposes too in specific. One, you get that septic stuff out of your trench, right? And if you're saying, well, what about the smell? Okay, if you're thinking about what we're dealing with here with, you know, no man's land, the trench warfare in the First World War that didn't start out that way but ended up being a quagmire, You've got rotting corpses, you've got mud, which just stinks in general, aggravated by water, rainfall, you've got rotting animals, you've got, you know, waste, you've got pee and poops, you know, the smell, septic, it's going to be everywhere. Um, throwing it out in front of your trench, it's not going to really affect you if you're used to that smell, which most of these guys, unfortunately, were. So, I mean, I'm sure it didn't smell great at all, but again, when you're used to it, I mean, you got to do what you got to do. And the second purpose for doing that is it creates more obstacles and a biological hazard and a cutting hazard for your enemy if they're storming your trench. So picture this. You've got guys running at you and they just get up, they get up about, you know, 10 feet away from your trench and they start slipping on your poop and stuff and they cut themselves open on one of the cans that you threw out there. They're getting poop and everything else disease ridden into their cut. Then they make it back to their trench and they get infected. They have to be off the line at least, whether they recover or not. They might lose a limb. You might have somebody that's completely off the line that's one down, just like a kill, all right? That counts as basically getting one, you know, an enemy soldier off the battlefield. Biological warfare at its most primitive state, but highly effective. So that's the two purposes that served, and that's part of the sanitation that was done. I know I didn't really know about that and then learned about that and said, you know, as nasty and shitty, no pun intended, well, actually pun intended, yes, as nasty as shitty as that is, that's a very effective strategy and it's also a psychological thing. You know, I, I'm sure that when you go out, you've got your little lanes that they didn't throw that stuff in and they made sure of so you didn't have to step in your own guy, in your buddy's poop and pee, but the enemy is not going to be caring if they got that far. They're going to be panicking, trying to scramble to get in. And they're going to be just having a rough time, literally falling. And, oh, God. Anyway, that's what happened a lot of times. As far as other sanitation measures for, you know, waste, I actually don't, I haven't really heard of much. It was very primitive at that point, and especially when people started, like, in the later part of the war, when it started becoming a more um, movement-oriented kind of warfare, when things kind of got on the move. You're just going to see a lot of slit trenches or holes or whatnot, and... Uh, it's going to be about that level. So, all right, that's about all I've got on that subject. If I missed anything or, you know, I'm sure I missed something. I always miss something. I'm not an expert. I'm just some guy that been obsessed with this stuff for about 20 years. Uh, but if you got any questions, I'll try to answer them, put them in the comments. But that should explain the basic macro kind of overview of um, sewage and septic stuff in the First World War. So if you like this video and you like the other content and you, um, you know, just kind of like what you see and you're learning stuff, uh, just take the time to uh, thank my sponsors of this video and the others, which is my Patreon supporters and channel members. So Patreon support and channel membership has grown significantly this past year, and so has my level of being able to do stuff with um, different content. We're going to be doing a lot of ballistic tests this summer. This year is just going to be awesome because we actually I, – I prefer to stay uh, not corporate-funded. I prefer to stay uh, crowd-funded and self-funded. That would be really great because I don't really, I'm not a fan of watching people that have paid sponsorships where it's like uh, half of the video is just them talking about, you know, some product that they might or might not like. And I mean, I'll review products. If a company wants to send me a product to review, I'll do that. That's a different ball game. But as far as this taking money and having this obligation thing, I'd rather just have the obligation to make content to my uh, viewers um, and being supported by viewers like you. So if you want to do that, link to Patreon is in the description. Become a channel member, five bucks a month or more on either platform. It's in the Discord server, which is actually really fun. A lot of people on there. Um, if you can't do that, if you can't do uh, support the channel financially, I totally get that. You can just sh like, share, and subscribe like you know how to do. It's 2021. You should know how to use YouTube right now. I shouldn't have to tell you, but just in case, there's a friendly reminder. Um, that really does help out 
the channel too, getting more exposure and hopefully people can get interested in the first world war. So that's all I've got for that episode. Again, I appreciate you all watching and we'll see you on the next episode of the first world war.